And good morning, everyone. Happy Wednesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. Hey, don't forget, I mean, here we are. Uh, this month is slipping away. You don't want to fail to take advantage of my special introductory offer on this book. Uh, you're going to save yourself a little bit over $12 by going to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com, ordering the book. It, it's, I'm sorry, I, you know, it's just, this is a fantastic deal, all right? So once again, for the rest of December 2023, U.S. orders only, total delivered price, $22.95. Again, saving you 12 bucks and more. Okay, take advantage of it. All right, well, we, we've summarized what we have said in our earlier teaching on Matthew chapter 24. We now come to chapter 25. Let me remind you that the great majority of commentators believe that the Olivet Discourse is divided into two different subjects. And here's something kind of remarkable. Over the last several years, as, as a direct result, by the way, as a direct result uh, of the growth of the Preterist movement, I've started seeing different commentators say, well, no, uh, uh, the Olivet Discourse is not divided at verse 36, after all. No. It's divided at chapter 25, verse 1. Because in the previous discussion of the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is not talking about the kingdom. But in chapter 25, we've got the kingdom of heaven is like. Why does that mean there's a break in subject? Why does that mean that in all of chapter 24, he's discussing the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, which is the end of one kingdom and the full establishment of the new covenant kingdom? Where is that necessitated by Jesus now saying, Oh, the kingdom of heaven is like. That makes no sense, ladies and gentlemen. There's, uh, there's no contextual justification for breaking the subject so radically. Uh, I mean, that would be such a, quote, subtle shift as to make one ponder and go, who would catch on to that? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, as I point out in one of my newest books, uh, the book before the resurrection book, the Sukkot book, these were the days of vengeance in which all things must be fulfilled. All throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament, there was an unbroken chain of testimony that connected the coming of the kingdom, the judgment, the resurrection, the coming of the Lord, salvation, etc., etc., that connected all of those motifs to the time of judgment of the old covenant world. Pass, it's passing away. So upon what basis then would it be argued that, well, uh, Matthew chapter 25, Jesus changes the subject from the judgment of the old covenant world. Now he's talking about the coming of the kingdom. Well, I'm sorry, the coming of the kingdom would be at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 21, 28 to 32, Jesus said, when these things begin to take place, then lift up, lift up your heads, because you know the kingdom of heaven is drawn near. It's arrived. There's no break. And listen to me. Nothing could more epitomize a couple of different elements here. Nothing could more epitomize the time of the wedding and salvation and judgment and kingdom than the narrative of the wedding. Because you see, in Amos, as the Lord was promising that the 10 northern tribes were about to be swept away into Assyrian captivity. 
the Lord said, I am about to destroy the kingdom of Israel. Not the family, the kingdom. Okay. But what would God do when he, <coughs> when he destroyed the kingdom? Well, according to Hosea chapter 2, he was going to divorce them. Right her, that's the ten tribes, a bill of divorcement. She is not my wife. I am not her husband. Okay. So in the, in the Old Testament, we have the story of the destruction of the kingdom at the time of the divorce. Now watch this. At the time of the divorcement, God departed. Hosea chapter 5, 15 and following. I will smite them. I will be as a young lion, as a lion to Israel, as a young lion to Judah. I will strike them with a wound from which no man could deliver them. I will return to my place until they repent and turn back to me. Hosea 5, again, 14 and following. So what did God do when he divorced Israel? He departed. But he said, I will go back to my place until they return. <clears throat> and in chapter 6, Israel so, says, come, let us return to the Lord, for he will come to us, and he will raise us up, that's resurrection, and we will live in his sight. So at the divorcement, that's divorce, God departed, and he put her to death. But what was he going to do? He was going to return, and in Hosea chapter 2, 19 and following, the Lord says that in the last days, in the days of the new covenant, Hosea 2, 18, God said, I'm going to make a new covenant with you, and I will betroth you to me again. I will betroth you to me in righteousness. I will betroth you to me in or forever. So what would God do at his return? Oh, he would remarry her. If God remarried her, whereas he had divorced the kingdom, destroyed the kingdom, but now he's going to restore her, was he not going to restore the kingdom? Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Now, that doesn't mean it's going to restore the kingdom in the same old nationalistic way because the covenant itself, the new marriage covenant, was not supposed to be like the old one. And he was going to destroy that nationalistic kingdom and it would never rise again. But he would restore the kingdom, his sovereignty, his rule. He would restore that. So what do we have in the Olivet Discourse. In the Olivet Discourse, we have the divorcing of Judah. And remember, even in Hosea, the Lord said that Israel, the ten northern tribes, had sown the wind, they were going to reap the whirlwind. Well, what was that reap? What was that harvest that they were going to reap? Being carried off, being destroyed, being swallowed up by the Gentiles. And then in chapter six, verse that's chapter eight, <clears throat> seven and eight. And in Hosea chapter 6, verse 11, the Lord said, I've seen a horrible thing in Ephraim, in Israel. And they've got their harvest. But he said, but you, O Judah, you also have your harvest in the day when I return the remnant, the captivity. 
So you see what we find in the New Testament is the time of Judah's harvest of destruction. That's Matthew 24. Because the Lord was coming. Going to bring on them the great tribulation. The greatest tribulation such as has never had never been, nor ever would ever yet would be. And that would be at his coming, his parousia. To do what? To gather the elect, you know, Hosea 6.11. Judah's harvest, national destruction. And by the way, just like God had put away Israel, the ten northern tribes, because they had committed adultery, spiritual adultery, why was God going to, going to destroy Judah? Well, because three times Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Because you see, Judah of the first century was committing spiritual adultery just like the 10 northern tribes had. And so God promised that he was going to destroy Judah, the kingdom of Judah. He was going to take the scepter away, Genesis 49, verse 10. Ancient rabbis used to say that was an extremely troublesome text because it says the lawgiver and a scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Oh, the gathering? Yeah. But what would happen to Judah in the last days? The scepter, the nationalistic scepter, would pass from the tribe or the kingdom of Judah and be given to the lion of the tribe of Judah. So Judah had to have her harvest. And in the book of Revelation, this great city, this great harlot city, is destroyed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. The scepter passes from nationalistic Judah to the lion of the tribe of Judah. Why? Because this harlot city has committed fornication with the kings of the earth because she had adulterated herself. Sebastian Smolars, a very noted scholar, has pointed out that the word harlot, used so extensively in the New Testament and in the book of Revelation particularly, is used some 91 times in the Old Testament. In 86 out of the 91 times, it is used of a wife who has become adulterous, you know, like in Hosea. You know, like the wife in Revelation, chapter 18, who says, I am no widow. You go back to Isaiah, chapter 54, and you see the background for that. The point being, Judah was now the adulterous wife to be put away. But you see, in the Old Testament, we find this absolutely glorious promise that God was going to, be, to betroth Israel, but not just the 10 northern tribes, but the whole house of Israel. But he couldn't, he couldn't betroth, he couldn't marry the whole house of Israel until Judah was divorced. Then he could take the whole house of Israel and transform them into the body of Christ. That's what Ezekiel 37 is all about. That's what Isaiah 62 is all about, in which the Lord was predicting the last days, the coming of Messiah, the coming of Israel's salvation. And he says, you shall no longer be called forsaken, but you shall be called Hephzibah. 
For as a young man rejoices over his bride, so shall I rejoice over you, for you shall be called Beulah. That's the whole nation. That's the whole house of Israel. And that means, ladies and gentlemen, that Matthew chapter 25, the story of the coming of the Lord. And by the way, N.T. Wright correctly points out this coming of the Lord for the wedding is Jesus's way of saying Hosea and Isaiah and Jeremiah are being fulfilled. The time for Israel's restoration, not in the way she longed for, not in the way that she expected, not in the way the first century Jews absolutely demanded, but nonetheless, God was returning for the marriage. Matthew 25 is not about the end of time. It is about the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel to remarry Israel, the whole house of Israel, in the last days. That doesn't belong to the end of the Christian age. It belongs to the end of the old covenant age and the institution of the new covenant, marriage covenant. Hey, I'm completely out of time. I hope you see the point and the power of seeing Matthew chapter 25, 1 to 13, within the context of God's fulfillment of his old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel, how it is not applicable to the end of the current Christian age in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Okay? Thanks again for joining me. Be sure to join me on Friday. We are drawing right down. I mean, we're almost done with our review and refutation of the book by Steve Gregg, Why Not Full Preterism. Be sure to join me for that. And then, of course, with Mike Sullivan for Preterist Apologetics. I'll see you on Friday.